Thank you for coming. It's uh, a great pleasure to have uh, together our, our special guest, uh, Neil Kaplovic. Neil and I, we, we met many years ago. Uh, and we've been uh, seeing each other very, very often. Uh, and also, I think he's responsible for, uh, in one of the meetings in his house, he introduced me to Sally Lou which uh, some of you know, uh, she's my colleague, collaborator, and great friend for maybe, I don't know how many years. So it's all thanks to 20 years. So 20 years, uh, 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 and it's all thanks to, to Neil. Anyway, he's a professor of medicine and director of the University of South Carolina Research Center for Liver Disease, which is a liver disease center funded by, by the NIH. And he's also the chief of the Division of Gastroenterology uh, on liver disease at the uh, University of S South California, the Keck School of Medicine. He, he's a physician scientist, a, 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 a rare species in, in Europe. So he's a, a, a physician that knows a lot of cellular, molecular, and biochemistry. Um, uh, and it's an interesting position because I think he can bridge better than when you do it from the other direction, from biochemistry or chemistry, the basic on the uh, 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 apply or, or, the, or the medical research. Um, he uh, started his uh, career as a resident, I think, in, in Bellevue Hospital in New York, and then has been in places like the Albert Einstein, Cornell University, Rockefeller University, and after being at the uh, VA Medical Center, I think in, in, in another state, moved to, to, to California, which has been for many years. Now, uh, first at the University at, at UCLA as an assistant research professor, full professor, and then moved to the University of South California, where he established, I think, this uh, excellent uh, hub in, 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 in liver. Uh, uh, physiology, medicine, and physiopathology. He's uh, working for more than 30 years, I think, on hepatotoxicity, the role of glutathione, mitochondria, oxidative stress, um, well, uh, 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 hepatotoxicity. He has trained a, a number of uh, very well-known people. Uh, one known for many of you is Sally Lou. He's uh, one of the uh, uh, nothing leading uh, 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 hepatologist in U.S., but uh, uh, if I remember well, you also trained Taki Yamada, right? Uh, uh, I don't know if that n name sounds familiar to you, but if you go to the Bill Gates Foundation, uh, he's the president of the uh, Bill Foundation, Belinda and Bill Gates Foundation. He, I think one is good not only for what the world one is doing, but also for the people he has trained. Um, so I think we would all like to have a student like Sally Lou uh, Ataki Yamada. Well, anyway, thank you, Neil, for coming here. It's really a pleasure, and uh, we look forward to your lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, 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 as uh, Jose has said, uh, uh, we've known each other for more than 20 years, and uh, I remember uh, the first time meeting you in Madrid, actually, in uh, your, in your center there. So uh, I'm going to uh, try to concentrate on some, uh, some of the more recent uh, research that uh, has been going on in my lab. <clears throat> and uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Mato said, uh, I have been studying the problem of hepatotoxicity and uh, the pathogenesis of liver injury uh, for more than 30 years, probably 40 years, actually. Um, and uh, uh, I can tell you today, uh, quite simply, that we still don't fully understand these things, which is good, I suppose, because it keeps, uh, it keeps us going. Uh, and uh, the work that I've been doing recently uh, really uh, deals with the interplay of uh, stress signaling and mitochondria and hepatotoxicity. So just to give you a, a, and I'm not going to give a lot of background. I'm sort of going to jump into this pretty soon. 
but let me just uh, remind you, um, you know, when we think about stress signaling, whether it's hepatotoxicity or in any context, uh, we're, we're really looking at sort of a yin and yang of adaptive and protective mechanisms and injurious mechanisms. And, and we know, you know, from a variety of uh, vast amount of work in the, in the, the field that uh, there are antioxidant responses that are adaptive and protective. Uh, one can view uh, much of the unfolded protein response as a, an adaptive, protective response. Uh, mitochondrial biogenesis uh, in response to uh, injury is another adaptive response. And for the most part, uh, autophagy and, and mitophagy can be considered largely adaptive, protective responses. And on the other hand, there are a number of signal transduction mechanisms that seem to participate in promoting injury. Uh, and <clears throat> I'm going to today uh, perhaps stress the MAP kinase uh, aspect most. Uh, we have also studied uh, the role of glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta, which is sort of a, a very interesting enzyme uh, m mostly implicated in the pathogenesis of myocardial ischemic injury, but, uh, but also uh, 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 playing an important role in our studies. ER stress, which is sort of the uh, extension of uh, inadequate or uh, overwhelmed unfolded protein response. And more recently, there's been a lot of interest in uh, program necrosis and or necroptosis and the role of uh, RIP kinases in, in that regard. And if I have time, I may touch on that, but uh, I've sort of put that at the back. So, uh, oh, <laughs> before I go on, uh, I, I'll, I'll talk mostly today about um, uh, models that uh, uh, reflect acute liver injury and uh, one model that, uh, that we particularly have studied for many, many years is uh, acetaminophen, abbreviated APAP. Uh, you, I guess you could probably call it paracetamol. Uh, and uh, although that's, I know that's not a huge problem in uh, Spain, uh, in the UK and the United States, um, uh, uh, liver, acute liver failure due to this drug is the number one uh, cause of uh, acute liver failure. More than 50% uh, of all cases of acute liver failure in the United States are caused by acetaminophen, and uh, less than half of those instances are due to suicidal overdoses, but rather to taking the sort of the maximum or slightly more than the maximum approved amount. So this is a, a particularly dangerous drug that would never be approved today. And uh, the politics of why it still exists uh, are something that we could talk about at over lunch, I guess. Um, the other model that I'll discuss is a little is different than a drug or toxin model, it, and that is the, the uh, cytokine uh, TNF uh, model. In the liver, in order to induce uh, injury, from TNF, one has to interfere with NF-kappa B uh, uh, gene uh, expression or the regulation of NF-kappa B responsive genes. Because liver cells are impervious to TNF unless NF-kappa B is inhibited. And the, uh, the standard approach is to use galactosamine, especially in vivo, because galactosamine is a toxin which inhibits uh, RNA synthesis relatively globally. Uh, but it's targeted to the liver, to hepatocytes. So it particularly is selective at interfering uh, in hepatocytes. And of course, acetaminophen is almost exclusively a hepatocyte toxin, although it does damage the kidney. And I'll talk about in vivo and, and uh, primary ma mouse hepatocyte studies. Being a physician, uh, I, 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 I particularly like to study diseases, and uh, to me, the in vivo models are the, uh, the vo very critical ones, so I, I like to show uh, whatever the uh, signal transduction and pathophysiology is in, in that case. And then uh, the second part uh, uh, of the uh, talk, I'm going to turn to a, 
some recent work we've done on mitochondrial biogenesis. Uh, and uh, uh, the response uh, uh, in terms of specific mitochondrial toxins, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So with regard to acetaminophen, just to give you the background, acetaminophen is mainly metabolized to glucuronide and sulfate metabolites, which are not toxic. And only a small percentage of a therapeutic dose of acetaminophen is converted by P450s, mainly 2E1, to a reactive electrophilic quinonamine, which is abbreviated NAPQI. And I published my first paper on acetaminophen about, about 1975 or so. Uh, and uh, uh, there were thousands of papers published on the pathogenesis of acetaminophen. And, and, we, and as you'll see today, we're still trying to figure out exactly how this toxin causes uh, liver injury. But the dogma up until the last few years had been that this reactive metabolite preferentially is detoxified by reaction with glutathione. So the electrophile nucleophilic uh, adduction uh, catalyzed by glutathione transferases, so it's preferential for glutathione. When all the glutathione is depleted, then this reactive metabolite will bind covalently to protein thiol groups. And this combination of protein thiol uh, alkylation or arylation and profound glutathione depletion, especially in mitochondria, is a believed, has been believed to be a lethal event. And uh, th this is followed, and this is sort of the you know, classical toxicology thinking. This is kind of like a thermonuclear attack on the mitochondria. It just wipes it out. Uh, and there's a bioenergetic failure. Uh, because of loss of mitochondrial function. So uh, before I get into our, some of our work, I just want to remind you, you all, um, most of you I'm sure, are familiar with the MAP kinases. Aside from uh, uh, cytokine and uh, uh, receptor signaling pathways, uh, reactive oxygen species are well known to activate MAP kinases and, and through the cascade of MAP3 kinases, 2 kinases, and MAP kinases. And I'll be talking um, particularly about the JNK pathway and its upstream uh, MKK4 and 7 uh, kinases. So a, a few years back, as you can see, uh, I had a postdoc from Japan, and I was just trying to figure out something for him to do. So I, I asked him to look at uh, the response of hepatocytes to uh, uh, glutathione depletion. Uh, uh, particularly in response to TNF, to see whether glutathione depletion would sensitize to TNF. And that's not going to be the subject I'm going to talk about. It did, whoops. But what was interesting was that when we used um, uh, uh, acetaminophen as our m mechanism for depleting glutathione, uh, we saw, as we expected to see, quite a bit of necrosis in hepatocytes in culture uh, and covalent binding, sorry, and glutathione depletion. But when we used a small molecule inhibitor of JNK, uh, which had become available just around then, which is relatively specific, uh, it actually markedly protected against uh, acetaminophen-induced necrosis, but did not alter the amount of glutathione depletion or covalent binding. And uh, there was sustained JNK activation as well, uh, as shown here as uh, uh, phosphocedrine as a readout for sustained JNK activation, which was also um, inhibited by the uh, SP06001025. Uh, so this, this was a kind of surprise to us. Why would... Uh, why would a JNK inhibitor protect against this uh, toxin? And uh, so we then did a dose response uh, study in vivo using uh, massive increasing doses of acetaminophen. You can see the serum ALT levels are strikingly elevated. Normal is about 50. 
and uh, in the presence of this inhibitor, there was marked protection. And because we always worry about small molecule inhibitors, uh, we also uh, developed a collaboration with the ISIS Pharmaceutical Company in Carlsbad, California. Uh, and they develop proprietary antisense molecules that can be injected in vivo. So we, in essence, knocked down uh, J and K1 and 2, as shown here, in, in the liver, in vivo. Uh, and you can see on the left here, uh, with control antisense, there's marked central lobular coagulative necrosis, destruction of the central portion of each liver lobule. But when, when uh, J and K was uh, uh, markedly uh, uh, silenced, there's no injury. And nevertheless, glutathione depletion uh, was unaltered with a JNK inhibitor or antisense. Uh, the, the administration of uh, acetaminophen still depleted glutathione with the same time course and, and to the same profound extent. And you could even give the JNK inhibitor several hours after the acetaminophen. By two hours after giving a dose of acetaminophen to mice, it's all gone. Uh, and yet, we could come in at that point with a J and K inhibitor and protect. And uh, a colleague up at University of Washington developed an analog to acetaminophen called uh, AMAP. So it's a regioisomer. Uh, it's not toxic because it doesn't deplete glutathione in mitochondria. It does in the cytoplasm, but not in mitochondria. And uh, we isolated mitochondria and showed that after acetaminophen, there's increased hydrogen peroxide release uh, and J and K activation. But the uh, analog, which is not toxic, uh, did not induce uh, mitochondrial reactive oxygen species release. Uh, and did not activate J and K. And other means of, in cell culture for inducing oxidative stress, as, as one would expect, uh, led to activated J and K, as reflected here in uh, the phosphorylated forms of J and K. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the acetaminophen, of course, uh, interfered with mitochondrial functionality. You can see over the time course of four hours, mitochondrial function is impaired. This is the respiratory control ratio. ATP levels uh, uh, decline. And when the animals are treated with a J and K inhibitor, these effects are somewhat abrogated to a level that's consistent with non-lethality. And one of the interesting things that we uh, discovered at this time was that J and K, when it was activated in this context, translocated to the mitochondria, which was really kind of an interesting surprise to us. So uh, you can see here, this is time after uh, administration of acetaminophen. Uh, J and K appears associated with mitochondria, uh, as shown here. Uh, in the presence of the J and K inhibitor, there's inhibition of J and K uh, activation in the cytoplasm, not shown here, and translocation to the mitochondria. Let's skip that. So, uh, so I just want to then just show you uh, an example of uh, uh, the next thing we did, which was to take purified, activated J and K one or two. There are two isoforms in the liver and add them directly to mitochondria. And uh, you can see when, when you add J and K1 or 2 uh, to mitochondria of, from control animals, nothing happens. When you add them uh, to the, and, and notice that to begin with, the mitochondrial function is markedly impaired with acetaminophen alone. But in mitochondria isolated from animals that had received acetaminophen with the J and K inhibitor, there's partial impairment. But when we add the activated J and K, uh, there's further interference with mitochondrial functionality 
to a level seen with acetaminophen alone in vivo. And we could block that with cyclosporin A, which is an MPT inhibitor, suggesting that the addition of activated J and K2 mitochondria that are made vulnerable by acetaminophen induces a sequence of events, uh, how direct, I'm not sure, uh, that leads to the permeability transition pore opening and complete loss of mitochondrial function. So this was our working model up until um, about a year ago, and that is uh, that acetaminophen is converted in the cytoplasm, in the ER, to a reactive intermediate, which enters the mitochondria, where it depletes glutathione and induces covalent binding, which one could view as the first hit. But this is not enough to kill the cell. It does induce release of reactive oxygen species and other reactive species, which then activate the MAP kinase cascade. And one of the ways that it, this is known to happen uh, is uh, through activation of the MAP3 kinase ASK1, which is normally uh, tethered to thioredoxin. But oxidative stress oxidizes thioredoxin, releasing uh, ASK1, which then activates a MAP2 kinase and, and JNK. Uh, it, there are also alternative possibilities. But ultimately, JNK is activated. It translocates to the mitochondria. And at least in vitro, this leads to MPT. So the question is, what is JNK targeting in the mitochondria? And uh, is this really an important event? I mean, JNK activation appears to be very important. When we inhibit JNK activation, despite not changing acetaminophen metabolism, we prevent liver injury, suggesting that the signaling mechanism is critical for toxin-induced cell death. But the, whether the mitochondrial translocation is important, we, don't, we can't tell from these experiments. So we started hunting for a target for J and K. And that brings me to the one piece of background, which is a, a protein called SAB, uh, which, uh, uh, for which there were very, there's very little known. But uh, there was a paper. Uh, a few years ago. This is what SAB stands for. I won't, you can read it. I, uh, it, it, um, it was identified as a, a, a Bruton, uh, tyrosine, Bruton's tyrosine kinase uh, binding protein. But this paper in 2002 in Biochem Journal identified uh, SAB as being a target of uh, uh, activated JNK uh, in uh, murine and human fibroblasts exposed to anisomycin, which is a, a chemical uh, agent that's used to activate uh, 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 stress kinases. And uh, they showed uh, by two hybrid screen and uh, co-immunoprecipitation and uh, co-localization that, uh, 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 that activated JNK and SAB associate on mitochondria. So that's all that was known. So we decided to look into SAB because it was the only possible target we could identify. Uh, so first, uh, we wanted to see if SAB is expressed in the liver. And uh, this is shown here. This is the mitochondrial fraction. SAB uh, is exclusively uh, found in the liver. This is the whole homogenate cytoplasm ER. I'm not showing nucleus. Uh, and uh, it, you know it, it localizes with. Uh, uh, to uh, the prohibitin uh, fraction. Uh, we then wanted to know, is SAB on the outer membrane, or is it inside the mitochondria? So we did a proteinase uh, K protection study. And you can see that SAB is degraded with increasing uh, exposure to proteinase K, similar to VDAC, the, the voltage-dependent anion channel, which is an outer membrane protein. So whereas uh, uh, intermem intermembrane and matrix cytochrome C and ornithine transcarbamylase were not digested. So SAB is an outer membrane protein. And uh, I won't go through this in detail. In, in 
primary hepatocytes exposed to acetaminophen. Uh, let me just co uh, immunoprecipitation of uh, SAB brings down J and K. Immunoprecipitation of phospho J and K brings down SAB, so they uh, uh, co immunoprecipitate. So then we really wanted to know whether this is an important protein in toxicity. So the the next thing we did is a, uh, an adenoviral uh, shRNA approach, and we uh, ad administered uh, LAC-Z as a control and adenoviral uh, SH SAB. And you can see that this is in vivo, um, that uh, uh, the control was unaffected, SAB expression was unaffected, but in the uh, knockdown, uh, it's very highly uh, uh, knocked out. So there's almost no SAB there. And uh, uh, it was, it's always important when you study acetaminophen to make sure that what you're doing is not alter, I'm sorry, I'm blocking your view, uh, that you're not altering the metabolism of acetaminophen or the glutathione as reflected in P450 expression and glutathione depletion, both of which, as you can see here, are unaffected by SAB knockdown. So when we gave a, a large dose of acetaminophen here, uh, whether uh, in, the, in the two, uh, the control and the SAB knockdown, glutathione depletion is massive uh, and uh, uh, equal. So that means acetaminophen metabolism is unchanged. And that's glutathione depletion in the whole liver and in mitochondria. And I just want to point out that <clears throat> um, th these uh, uh, adenoviral-treated uh, uh, animals' livers had no difference in the levels of ex basal expression of, of any of the MAP relevant MAP kinases, uh, or uh, BACs, for that matter. And uh, BACs will become relevant a, a little later. Ba but BACs is dispensable in acetaminophen toxicity. And acetaminophen toxicity is very well characterized as a necrotic cell death. It is not an apoptotic cell death. And probably the main reason for that is the massive glutathione depletion and oxidative stress, which just incapacitate an apoptotic machinery. OK, so then what happened to J and K in the SAB silenced animals? Uh, after giving acetaminophen. So if we look at the left panel first, cytoplasm and mitochondria, you can see that after giving acetaminophen, there is sustained J and K activation, and also sustained activation of the MAP2 kinase. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have an antisera to phospho-ASK1, the MAP3 kinase. But at least uh, the upstream kinase is also sustained activated. And there's translocation to the mitochondria of both. On the other hand, when SAB is silenced, J and K activation and, and uh, MKK4 activation is very transient. And there is no translocation to mitochondria. So there is no J and K binding or MKK4, phospho-MKK4 binding to mitochondria if SAB is silenced. So now the obvious question is, what happened to the liver? Did, you know, did we kill the liver or protect the liver? And that's shown here. So serum ALT level in acetaminophen uh, administered control, laxy control, over 10,000 ALT level, uh, and uh, very minimal increase after uh, silencing SAB. This is the uh, hemorrhagic central lobular necrosis that you typically see with acetaminophen, and there's virtually no abnormality uh, in the SH-SAB-treated animals. So removing SAB from the scene uh, prevented uh, acetaminophen toxicity without changing acetaminophen metabolism or glutathione depletion. And and it also protected against uh, loss of mitochondrial function. This is the control showing what decreased respiratory control ratio. Uh, also, we looked at nitrotyrosine. 
so one of the things that's somewhat controversial in this field is the role of nitrotyrosine in the cell death mechanisms, but uh, the, this uh, dark staining is uh, central lobular nitrotyrosine staining. And uh, one of the characteristic things about nitrotyrosine formation in this model is that it all occurs in the mitochondria. And uh, you may not be able to appreciate the punctate um, nitrotyrosine staining, but this has been looked at by several labs, and uh, it's almost exclusively mitochondrial nitrotyrosine formation. And there's some controversy in this field, which I don't really have any, anything to weigh in on, um, regarding what the source of that nitric oxide is. Um, because uh, ENOS and INOS knockout animals are not protected against this. Uh, and there's some recent ar argument that it's neural N-nitric oxide synthase that it, it generates this NO. But it's not clear that there's increased NO or whether N this, this nitrotyrosine staining really reflects peroxynitrite generation. That, that's, it's, it's, in a sense, a readout for increased peroxynitrite. And just by generating more reactive oxygen species, more superoxide, in the presence of even uh, constitutive NO, you'll generate peroxynitrite and nitrotyrosine staining. So the point here is that SAB silencing prevented much, you can see just a little bit of nitrotyrosine staining around the central lobular hepatocytes. So that would argue that um, the interaction of J and K with SAB leads downstream to reactive oxygen species, in, enhanced reactive oxygen species and uh, nitrotyrosine formation in mitochondria. So the interaction is necessary for, for this to occur. And that's sort of said here. Um, I'll skip that. So, uh, and just the same thing, you know, one thing about in vivo studies is they're great because they're relevant, but, you know, the in vivo liver is, a compo is composed of a whole variety of different cell types, hepatocytes, endothelial cells, Kupfer cells, stellate cells, and, and immunocytes. So this is just to show you that when we isolated the hepatocytes after treating in vivo with S, uh, adenoviral SH SAB, uh, the hepatocytes in culture were then exposed to acetaminophen and were protected against uh, acetaminophen. So, you know, what, uh, that's awfully dark, but I, I guess it's okay. Uh, so then the, the question is, you know, acetaminophen is interesting, and, you know, uh, a lot of us uh, sort of make, build our career on acetaminophen, uh, and uh, there are thousands of papers. But uh, what about another relevant model? And that's why we turn to the TNF-galactosamine model. And the reason we turn to that model is that there is some literature to suggest that this is another JNK-dependent toxicity already known to be J and K dependent, and I'm not showing you, but we verified that when we used the J and K inhibitor, we could protect against TNF-galactosamine. The other interesting thing to bear in mind is that this is a model in which hepatocytes die by apoptosis, not necrosis. So this is a TNF-induced apoptosis model. And you can see that the same thing happened. When we silenced uh, SAB, it, it, it virtually prevented galactosamine TNF-induced liver injury, which was really quite a surprise. I mean, a striking uh, uh, finding, to me, anyway. And uh, this is the, uh, the picture with respect to J and K. Let's just look at the left sides first. Uh, the laxy control after TNF-galactosamine, there's sustained J and K activation. Uh, MKK4 activation, uh, translocation to the mitochondria, but uh, when SAB is silenced, JNK activation is not sustained, and there, there's no translocation or virtually no translocation to mitochondria, uh, as you can see. Uh, the other interesting thing is that BACS 
uh, is known to translocate to mitochondria in this model in a J and K dependent fashion. And that didn't happen because J and K wasn't activated or its activation wasn't sustained, presumably. I can't tell you for sure that Bax does, doesn't bind to SAB, but uh, we're, we're currently looking at that. I doubt it, though. And uh, let me just remember what this is. This is just to uh, show you uh, an in vitro model. In primary hepatocytes, typically uh, one uses something like TNF actinomycin D as a way of inducing ap apoptosis. You can see uh, nearly 80% apoptosis is rapidly seen in, after six hours of uh, TNF uh, actinomycin D. And uh, there's sustained J and K activation, which is not sustained uh, when uh, SAB is silenced, and uh, there's protection against uh, TNF-induced apoptosis. And I just want to, I, I won't dwell on this, but uh, just to point out to you that in this TNF model, uh, the, the uh, adenoviral treatments did not alter the, um, in the initial um, uh, TNF signaling mechanisms in terms of uh, IKK activation, I-kappa B phosphorylation, and so on. Uh, that's unaltered. So SAB resides in the outer membrane of the mitochondria and binds activated J and K. Uh, decreased expression of SAB prevents the binding of activated J and K to mitochondria. Uh, it prevents sustained J and K activation and protects against J and K-dependent hepatotoxicity in both models. So uh, this is sort of the, conceptually the current way I sort of think about this. Uh, and that is acetaminophen through its reactive electrophilic metabolite or TNF through its uh, um, somewhat less well understood signaling mechanisms interfere with electron transport. And this generates reactive oxygen species, but is not in itself a lethal event. Reactive oxygen species then are released from mitochondria and activate the MAP kinase cascade. The, then J and K interacts with SAB. Uh, J and K can also promote activation of uh, uh, BCL2 uh, family members as well, or inactivation of protected, protective ones. Uh, but the uh, sustained interaction between phospho J and K and SAB uh, continues to interfere with electron transport and to continue to release reactive oxygen species in a vicious cycle. So if I go back now, I can show you that relevant slide. Oops, sorry. Oh, here it is. So uh, this month, a, an, another paper appeared finally on uh, 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 SAB, uh, this was published from a group at uh, Scripps in Florida, uh, using anisomycin uh, in uh, HeLa cells and, and uh, MEFs. They, they showed that anisomycin induced uh, activation of J and K as expected, uh, and uh, this in interacted with mitochondrial SAB and directly promoted increased reactive oxygen species. This only happened in SAB-treated cells, not in in other words, they, they took purified mitochondria or isolated mitochondria from these cells uh, and added activated J and K to the mitochondria and it induced reactive oxygen species. But if they took mitochondria from control cells and added activated J and K, this didn't occur. So there is some, there is some evidence that the interplay of SAB with, the, with um, of J and K with mitochondria induces an, an, an interference in electron transport, possibly at complex one, leading to uh, more reactive oxygen species release. And therefore, let me just skip back now. Um, and so our hypothesis then is that this creates, in the acetaminophen model, this creates this vicious cycle uh, leading to further electron transport interference and ultimately enough reactive oxygen species generation to induce the mitochondrial permeability transition poor. 
In the case of TNF, since this is not a necrotic cell death, the sustain, this sustained interaction uh, leads to the activation of uh, BACs, the inhibition of BCLXL, uh, the degradation, of, all these are known, the degradation of C-flip, and therefore uh, enhanced generation of T-bid, all of which uh, promote um, an apoptotic cell death. So um, I can uh, pause for a moment uh, if there are any questions, or I can just go on. Maybe I'll go on. Uh, so I'm just going to turn to something else here, uh, and that is, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure you, you picked the right uh, talk off my thing, but let's see what happens. <laughs> this will be an adventure for me, too. Okay, well, we're, um, what I'm going to, I'm switching gears now, and I'm going to talk a bit about mitochondrial biogenesis, uh, which is uh, a really fascinating issue, and it's part of the sort of yin and yang of uh, uh, adaptive responses to injury. So uh, we, we know a fair amount about this from, the, you know, from published work, and uh, particularly uh, Bruce uh, uh, Spiegelman and others have uh, very uh, uh, elegantly demonstrated over the recent five to ten years that a critical master regulator of mitochondrial biogenesis is PGC1-alpha, which is a co-activator of a variety of genes that regulate uh, many things, but uh, uh, particularly glucose metabolism and mitochondrial biogenesis. And even antioxidant defense has been uh, uh, another uh, group of genes. But anyway, <coughs> uh, PGC1-alpha is, uh, at least in liver cells, expressed at very, very low levels. It's hard to even detect it. And it but it responds uh, to metabolic uh, conditions uh, that, um, you know, like fasting, or, and I'll explain why. So PGC1-alpha is regulated mainly by transcription. And the, although there is other regulation as well, there's ubiquination and, uh, uh, and other uh, things that have been described, post-translational. But, but it, its level is very rapidly responsive to um, transcriptional regulation, and it's regulated mainly by CREB, a very important transcription factor. Now, CREB is known as the cyclic AMP response element binding protein. So it responds to cyclic AMP. And up until recent years, it was, it was thought that uh, the cyclic AMP was mediating a PKA, uh, protein kinase A dependent phosphorylation of CREB. And although that does happen, the main regulation is actually mediated through uh, transcriptional co-activators called CRTCs. They used to be called TORCs, but the convention is now to call them CRTCs. Uh, I think it's CREB, oh, I'm sorry, Cyclic AMP Regulated Transcription Co-Activator. Uh, and uh, this uh, is one, this is a family of uh, co proteins or genes, co-activators. CRTC1 is expressed almost exclusively in the brain, although it might also be in lymphocytes. Uh, CRTC2 and 3 are ubiquitous, so they're in the liver. Um, and uh, normally, these CRTCs are present in the cytoplasm uh, in a phosphorylated form bound to 1433. And most of the research in this field has been uh, uh, utilized uh, studies of CRTC2. And it is known that uh, uh, cyclic AMP-dependent mechanisms lead to the defos activation of a, of a phosphatase, which dephosphorylates CRTC, leading to its uh, release and translocation to the nucleus. Whereas um, AMP kinases promote phosphorylation of CRTC so that it is retained 
in the, in the cytoplasm bound to 14.3.3. So that, that, that's sort of the state of knowledge. So my question then is, and, and there's much work on uh, muscle and uh, fat cell mitochondrial biogenesis, but this very, and, and in response to metabolic stress. So my question, being sort of a toxicology-oriented person, is what is the, what is the uh, role of these uh, transcriptional coactivators when we in, impose a mitochondrial stress, as you might see in toxicity or at, in the situations I described to you on the previous part of the talk? So what we did then is... Um, started by establishing a model of uh, PGC1-alpha-dependent mitochondrial biogenesis in response to mitochondrial toxin. In this case, we use rot rotenone. Rotenone is a complex one inhibitor, which is rather specific, and therefore uh, interferes with electron transport and induces some element of oxidative stress from the mitochondria. So, and typically when you study mitochondrial biogenesis, at this stage we're looking mainly at uh, uh, mRNA and proteins, uh, gene expression. Uh, in this case, uh, the, uh, um, this is all real-time PCR. The, the, uh, uh, the downstream, some of the well-known downstream genes of PGC1-alpha alpha are shown here. When we treated with uh, rotenone, you can see that after a number of hours, there's upregulation of cy cytochrome C, uh, NRF1, which is a transcription factor that regulates mito other mitochondrial genes, uh, COX4, that's uh, cytochrome oxidase, and uh, heat shock protein 10, which is a uh, mitochondrial-specific chaperone. Uh, which is part of the mitochondrial stress response. So there's an interrelationship when we talk about mitochondrial biogenesis also with mitochondrial stress response, similar in a way to what one could think about in terms of ER stress, because ER stress uh, is a, a, a situation where there's um, increased production of chaperones that protect as well as in the, the uh, attempt to make more ER. So, so part of e the ER stress response is ER biogenesis. So there's a real analogy here. So uh, you can see the clue here is that we have uh, SH lax Z. Um, okay, so then we, we, uh, what we did is, uh, we, whoops, let me go back. We, we silenced the expression of uh, PGC1-alpha, uh, and that's shown here. And when we did that, this response uh, was blocked. So this is just the model. So we're, what I'm showing you then is that when we treat primary mouse hepatocytes or various types of li liver cancer cell lines as well, with um, Rotenone, we induce a mitochondrial stress, uh, which leads to a PGC1 alpha dependent mitochondrial biogenesis. So this is no no big news. So our question then is, what is the role of CRTC2 or CRTC3 in this response? So this again is to show that uh, there's uh, a, a preceding the mitochondrial biogenesis response, there's an induction of PGC1-alpha in response to rotenone. And so what we've now done is we've, we've silenced, we're going to compare silencing C CRTC2 and CRTC3. Uh, and uh, the way this experiment was done, by the way, and we've done this also in culture, but uh, is to give the adenoviral shRNA in vivo, isolate the hepatocytes, and do the experiments in culture. Uh, so, so you can see 
when we, this is a Western blot, that we've, we've decreased the expression of um, CRTC2, the most widely studied uh, CRTC in, in, and probably the most abundant uh, in liver. Uh, it had no effect on the PGC1-alpha response to rotenone. When we silence CRTC3, which is this band, we, we prevented the response. There was no mitochondrial biogenesis response to rotenone. And similarly, the down, downstream of PGC1-alpha, when, when uh, uh, CRTC2 is silenced, there's no no uh, effect on uh, other uh, mitochondrial genes whose names have disappeared from the slide somehow. And, uh, but, uh, you know, it's uh, heat shock protein 10, cytochrome C, and uh, whatever, uh, NRF1, I think. So you can see that uh, uh, the downstream uh, effect is also blocked. So, so why, you know, the question then that really is troublesome uh, is uh, why is there this selectivity? Uh, we know that from, you know, what's been published that CRTC2 and CRTC3 uh, are both uh, present in the cytoplasm, bound to 1433 as a phospho form, and almost all of both are supposedly there. So, uh, so it's, so it's a challenge now to try to figure out, you know, why there's this selectivity. So one possibility that, you know, I, I kind of liked is that maybe there's compartmentation and maybe there is uh, CRTC3 in mitochondria. And so the reason this is selective for mitochondrial stress is that it's being released from mitochondria. And the other possibility is much more difficult to deal with, which is that there's some unique signaling in response to mitochondrial stress, which leads to CRTC3 release in, from cytoplasm and not CRTC2, which is basically another way of saying who knows, you know, what the, it's very difficult to say what the mechanism is. So, uh, let me just see, yeah, this is okay. So we did look you know, at uh, subcellular fractionation. And uh, you can see that there is CRTC3 in the mitochondria. And uh, it's not very well shown here, but there really is no CRTC2. But it's, it's not very abundant. And the other problem is, even if there is CRTC3, a little bit of CRTC3 in the mitochondria, if it gets released, it's just going to mix with, this, with, with the abundant uh, CRTC3 in the cytoplasm. So why would it, you know, what, what would protect it from just, you know, being inactivated by phosphorylation? Uh, and uh, I guess the postdoc that I have working on this, uh, I guess he, he, one day uh, recently, he ran out of 7.5% uh, gel. So he did a, he ran a 15% uh, gel, because it was handy, oops. And lo and behold, a smaller form of CRTC, at least by Western blot, a, a smaller form of CRTC3 appeared, which we call the short form. It's about 23 kilodaltons. And uh, so that, that, you know, is very provocative. And it was exclusively in the mitochondria. And we could show, using um, uh, fairly high-resolution confocal imaging of a mitochondrial prep that, um, I don't know how well it projects, uh, that, you know, that there, this is, the green is the uh, mitochondrial membrane and uh, the red is the CRTC. This is a pan-torque antibody, so it recognizes either two or three. Uh, but it's a, a, a handy one for this type of experiment. 
uh, you can see that there is uh, CRTC associated with mitochondria in a similar fashion to a well-known matrix protein, heat shock protein 10. So, uh, so we then uh, try, we tried some maneuvers, and uh, this is still a work in progress, so I'm not going to be able to take this very far, uh, but I'll just tell you where we are now. Uh, so one thing we did is uh, uh, a C-terminal CFT tag, uh, and you can see that uh, we used Twinkle as a control. Twinkle is a uh, mitochondrial transcription regulator. It's a mitochondrial specific protein. So it's a good marker for mitochondria. So when you express, um, and so when you express, um, uh, and this is, a ant this is looking, probing with C uh, CFP antisera. Uh, CFP tagged um, twinkle appears uh, here, you know, expressed in, in the cytoplasm, post-mitochondria, as is CRTC3, as expected. Uh, we used uh, C-terminal uh, GFP, uh, CRTC2, which is commercially available. And when that was expressed, it was only present um, uh, in, uh, I mean, it was present in the cytoplasm, as you expect. On the other hand, when you look at mitochondria, um, twinkle is in the mitochondria, uh, CRTC3 is in the mitochondria, but uh, uh, CRTC2 is not. And uh, this, this shows up now using, this is now an antiserum to CRTC3. So CRTC3 overexpressed CF, uh, CFP tagged as shown here. In the post mitochondria and mitochondria, the endogenous is shown here. And obviously, there isn't a huge amount of the full length form in the mitochondria, and there is there the short form. Oops. Oh, and so the implication is that the C terminus is removed, and we're left with the N terminal portion or the middle of the molecule. To gain further insight into that, uh, we used, uh, 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 this doesn't show up very well, a his tag and an HA tag on the N and C terminus. And, uh, and then expressed this in HEC-293 cells. Uh, and it exposed the cells to either control or rotenone. And we looked at the post-mitochondria, mitochondria, and nucleus. And I hope I'm showing you the right slide. Yeah. So, uh, looking at anti-his tag, you can see the, that the the full length uh, protein is is uh, present in both the the cytoplasm and mitochondria, and we're still characterizing this, but. The short form is shown here in the mitochondria, and after uh, rotenone treatment of mitochondria, there's some decrease in the mitochondria and increase in the nucleus of the short form. This is, you know, as I say, still a work in progress. It's not the most definitive e example of that, but uh, and uh, the his tag is is uh, is here. And uh, you can see the short form has lost the, I mean, the HA tag is lost. And this is the, uh, the actual uh, anti-CRTC3. So uh, after rotenone, the mitochondrial uh, CRTC3, after overexpression, is lost. Uh, oops, I have to go through that first. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this, this declines and this increases after rotenone treatment. So we're kind of left with, a, with an intriguing hypothesis. So our hypothesis then is that uh, this portion, some 
significant portion of this uh, molecule, which is about, I think, about 75 kilodaltons normally, uh, is lost in the mitochondria, clipped. And it's interesting that this part of the molecule is where the 1433 binding site is and, uh, and the, pho the phosphorylation site. So it, it kind of makes sense that the, if the protein is targeted, and it does have a moderately, and I haven't shown you that, a moderate mitochondrial targeting sequence, the, 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 the uh, protein. So, you know, my, you know, my view then is that, or hypothesis is that when, we, when this portion of the molecule is removed, it, it liberates it from the um, requirement for sequestration when it's released. So when mitochondrial stress occurs, this short form of CRTC3 can be released, translocate to the nucleus, activate CREB and PGC1-alpha transcription. The problem, uh, we have many things to learn about this, and uh, we just, our first paper on this just appeared in JBC, the, I think this week or last week, and it just deals with the, um, uh, the, the uh, adenoviral silencing of CRTC2 and 3, not with the protein uh, identification, and we're still in the process of nailing that down. But this would offer an explanation for the selectivity of CRTC3 in terms of a, of a mitochondrial stress response. Uh, and uh, so how, how do we think about this? Uh, rotenone and, oh, and so how, how does it get released? So we're looking at the moment, first of all, how does it get processed from full-length CRTC to short CRTC3? And we're looking at, um, there are some clip, there's a clip, protein called clip, and there's some other proteases in mitochondria that we're currently uh, examining in that regard. Uh, but the, um, the point is that once, let's say, there's, there's mitochondrial stress and reactive oxygen species, what, what, it, what governs the release of, of this uh, protein? And uh, is it just nonspecific, which is certainly possible, that, you know, you just uh, knock off a few mitochondria, they just open up and release their, their content? All I can say in that regard is that when we did these experiments, I haven't shown you all the details, <coughs> we do not see the release of other matrix proteins at the time that CRTC3 is released from mitochondria. So it suggests that there's some specificity, but that's still open. And the, these are all viable cells, by the way. The, the cells are not dying here. But the individual mitochondria might be dying. That's certainly possible. And then this cascade is, occurs. Uh, the interesting thing uh, is that why, you know, why don't these cytoplasmic forms participate? And probably the reason is, I mean, and we've, sh we've shown the evidence of this, that the, there's increased uh, uh, AMP, in, in response to mitochondrial oxidative stress, there's increased AMP kinase activation. And this seems to promote uh, the sequestration of CRTC2, at full length CRTC2 and 3, which are in the, mito in the cytoplasm, to be retained in the cytoplasm. So they, they don't translocate. And I, I haven't shown you, we also have done chip assays uh, to show that um, the uh, CRTC3, but not CRTC2, um, uh, translocates to the promoter of PGC1-alpha under these conditions, although we haven't proved that it's the short form, and we're trying to do some, using the HIS tag currently, we're trying to do some uh, nickel uh, affinity work to try to purify the fragmented chromatin uh, to, uh, to look at this in more detail, but that, uh, that's a little bit tricky. So I think, I think I'm going to stop because uh, I, I have a whole other set of slides which probably you don't need to put on your website uh, if it's OK. Uh, so I just want to uh, acknowledge the current members of uh, my lab, uh, uh, some of whom work on uh, things that are not related to 
uh, what we're talking about today. You'll notice um, that there isn't an American name on the list, which is kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, because uh, America now is, is really mainly uh, uh, people from all over the world, which is a wonderful thing. So Derek Han is Korean, Sonda is um, from Myanmar, and got her PhD in Japan. Her husband, uh, uh, Tin Than, is also uh, from Myanmar and got his PhD in Japan. Wan Lu is from China. Uh, Zhang Zhu is an uh, MD from China who got his PhD in Japan. Cheng Ji is from China who got his PhD degree in the US. Uh, he's from Iran and uh, she's from Iran, Iran via Yale. Uh, former people are from Japan, Japan, Indonesia, Japan, Japan, Japan. Uh, collaborators at USC, uh, some of you maybe know Enrique Cadenas, I think he's from Argentina, the mitochondrial guy. Uh, Amy Lee, who collaborates with us on um, ER stress-related work that I didn't talk about. And uh, Jose Fernandez Chica from Barcelona, we still collaborate with. And uh, we have a, um, uh, as uh, Jose mentioned, we have an NIDDK-sponsored uh, USC Research Center for Liver Diseases. It's one of uh, four research centers for liver disease in the United States funded by NIH. The others are at Yale, UCSF, and Albert Einstein in uh, uh, New York. And uh, th these are very convenient. They're, in a way, it's very similar to what you have, but not, not nearly as well equipped. Uh, it, it, it's uh, an, a center that pr uh, provides support for core facilities and pilot and feasibility project research funding, mainly, and uh, an enrichment program and seminars. Uh, and uh, we have a cell and tissue imaging core, um, a cell separation uh, uh, and uh, culture, cell culture core, that's fax analysis, magnetic cell sorting, and re uh, routine uh, uh, primary cultures. Um, and we have uh, analytic instrumentation, and including proteomic and uh, me uh, metabolomic uh, core, which are uh, not, I'm, I'm envious of yours, uh, ours are not quite as uh, well equipped. So thank you very much. Questions, comments? So, so you said that this, uh, the, the system, the, the first system, talking about the APAP, this also occurs in HeLa cells and MEFs. So why do you predict that the effect on the liver, the hepatocytes, is so specific and strong? and not the other cells? Well, because, oh, because uh, acetaminophen is only metabolized in hepatocytes. In the case of acetaminophen, mm -hmm. APAP, yeah. it, it targets the liver only because it has to be con metabolized to a toxic intermediate, a quinone, a quinonamine. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen in any other cells other so, than so maybe renal epithelial cells. Sometimes. So really the specificity is the, the, toxin. the processing of it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, and that's a P452E1 particularly. But it, in the case of, let's say, TNF and uh, actinomycin D or whatever, that could be any, any cell, really. More questions? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to ask you about the GNK phosphorylation and its interaction with the subproteins. Uh, so, is it this interaction? Uh, it is enough to uh, make the release of uh, uh, reactive oxygen uh, species and to kill the cells. Just this uh, interaction. And uh, the other question is about the release of the CRTC3, uh, the short form. Uh, it can be, or I'm asking that, if uh, there is the cut of the long form, it will be in the cytosol, and then the short form, it will be translocated into the mitochondria or... 
good question. So. They're both excellent questions, and I don't really know the answer. To, oh, let me take the second one. Um, I don't have the answer to the second one. That's something we're certainly looking at. Um, but you know, we're in the very early uh, stages of that research. Um, so the question is, you know, I would think that it it gets clipped on the way in, but I'm not sure. And you know, we we just need to do more work, so that it, you know, it's not clear that the entire um, full length protein is in the matrix. Uh, that we have no evidence to support that f uh, with certainty. We know that the mitochondria contain her own DNA, so maybe we will go to the DNA, we try to find the sequence, or the, maybe it's just the short form of this protein is expressed into the DNA of the mitochondria, not the, length, the whole length of the protein. Did you no, make some? Yeah, it's not in the mitochondrial genome. Um, what, you know, you're, but you're, so that's not possible, but I think you're asking an interesting question which we've pondered which is whether the, this coactivator actually regulates uh, mitochondrial genes. And that's something we haven't yet looked at. But it's certainly conceivable uh, that it actually has a, you know, because there are, my, you know, 13 mitochondrial genes or something, and it might be that uh, this interacts with that, but we don't know that. Regarding your, your first question, it's sort of, it is my view that um, sustained J and K activation um, is lethal. And uh, it, it, it only occurs in lethal circumstances, and it requires the interaction of J and K with, sa with SAB. Uh, but the outcome is an effect on mitochondrial function either directly or indirectly. Directly, sort of like that group at Scripps suggested, and we did, we showed with our uh, acetaminophen uh, and activated J and K mitochondria studies, there can be a direct effect on mitochondria that are made vulnerable by some other condition. Acetaminophen, uh, TNF signaling, maybe ceramides, um, or, um, uh, 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 glutathione modulation or something like that that makes the or anisomycin that makes the mitochondria vulnerable to a second hit. But it's also conceivable that just the act of interaction with SAB is, a, is enough of a, uh, a platform for sustained uh, uh, MAP kinase pathway activation to um, recruit a second or indirect mechanism, which could be metabolic, uh, it could be uh, Bax translocation, uh, it could be uh, C flip degradation leading to caspase 8 activation of uh, BID to T BID and its translocation. It could be the in incapacitation of uh, MCL1 or BCL2 or BCLXL. So some interplay in the whole death cascade uh, in many places where J and K has been shown to uh, interplay. But for those to happen and death to occur, you have to have sustained J and K activation. So the transient J and K activation that occurs in normal signaling is ra it's just rapidly within you know 15 minutes or so it's gone because of you know uh, a variety of mechanisms largely antioxidant and it's been shown by Michael Karen and others that for sustained J and K activation to occur requires reactive oxygen species and the you know the um, uh, the expression of uh, NF kappa B dependent expression of um, SOD2, um, ferritin, uh, fer you know, and ver various, you know, antioxidant uh, measures uh, pr protect against uh, uh, TNF-induced cell death by, by preventing 
reactive oxygen species dependent J and K sustained activation. And it appears that in, in not only my work, but others, that mitochondria are an important source, source of the reactive oxygen species. So that's a long answer to a, your question. I don't know if I really answered it well, but it's still a, uh, clearly a work in progress, and it's, it's complicated. But one thing is clear. If there's no SAB, there's no, no uh, J and K dependent cell death. Is uh, SAB silencing affected liver regeneration after we partial haven't looked. It's a good question. Uh, and all, all, it's a great question. Are the proteins known to bind to SAB when you do the immunoprecipitation? We're 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 I'm doing that. Sure you we're we're working on that now. We just looked at J and K, but we are looking at that. And uh, uh, the answer is yes. <coughs> P, it's known that P thirty eight binds to Mm -hmm. SAB, although P38 doesn't play a role in these mm -hmm. models. Um, the other one was the original description was Bruton's tyrosine kinase, mm -hmm. which is actually an interesting one, and it maybe gives us maybe a little insight, because it's, it's present mainly in immune cells, <clears throat> and it's normally associated with um, SAB and, in it, and SAB actually inhibits that enzyme. So for that enzyme to be activated, it has to be released from SAB. Mm -hmm. The other interesting thing is that SAB is, there's, in that original study, they, they did e show some good evidence that J and K could actually phosphorylate SAB. And that's something else we're kind of looking at. So how that Very nice talk. I have a question trying to put together the two parts of your ah. talk. So you show that pec one alpha responds to, to this kind of mitochondrial stress, and you show that the pathotoxicity has a clear contribution of the mitochondria. So can you picture pec one alpha as a protective uh, stimuli in order to protect the liver? And can you use that therapeutically? Can you? promote a uh, sirtuin activation to enforce pgc one alpha activity, and have you tested it? We haven't tested it. I'm a little dubious, only in the sense that the acetaminophen model is such a rapidly progressive model um, that, you know, it, it really the, the fate of, the, even though it, ta it might take eight or ten hours for the cells to die, the, the fate is determined within a two or three hours. And, uh, you know, so wh whether there would be enough time, it's an interesting question. Certainly, there, the, co the flip side is true. I've seen several groups um, look at um, uh, up or down regulating mitophagy, and certainly um, inhibiting mitophagy worsens the picture, and promoting mitophagy seems to improve it. And there you could sort of see the rationale in the sense that the mitochondria is sort of the, you know, the Trojan horse. So it's a, you know, it's a de when the mitochondria are damaged, they're releasing reactive oxygen species and releasing uh, uh, proteins that could have adverse effects on the cell. So the faster you can get rid of damaged mitochondria, the, the, you, you can minimize intracellular uh, stress. So, um, and, and certainly when that happens, there's going to be a recovery, which will, meet, will be mitochondrial biogenesis. We haven't, I mean, it's a critical question, and we haven't really done it yet. Have you looked at the predisposition? Because since pgc one alpha is so tightly controlled nutritionally as well, can people be more susceptible to this type of toxicity by having different levels of... Yeah. Complicated question. The answer is yes, they can be. Um, the field is, is largely um, focused on glutathione, as it has been for the last 40 years, <clears throat> because um, it's sort of the... It's an unusual toxicity. It's sort of the poster child for glutathione, the importance of glutathione. 
because uh, everything centers around getting, depleting all the glutathione. And in fasting or poor nutrition, there, there's no question that the glutathione status is, is impaired and that uh, that will um, uh, uh, lower the threshold for toxicity. It's a big problem in, pe in people because, you know, although there are individuals who take, you know, su to do suicide and, and eat a whole bottle, which I gather is not very popular in Spain, luckily. I think sp people in Spain are so happy they don't commit suicide. But in the UK, it's really a big problem. They, they eat the whole bottle of it. And uh, that's a, but that, but having said that, there are, there are many cases where, you know, the, the four gram limit, four grams of acetaminophen per day is the limit. Uh, where people have taken five or six grams a day and have developed liver failure. Um, and so, you know, something obviously is modulating susceptibility. So um, some of it relates to the status of P452E1. Some of it relates to nutrition and glutathione status. But there are many others, as you, you, you know, interestingly suggest, that could be very important. Clearly, it's a very you know fertile area to look at. Hmm. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, comments. Thank you, Neil, yeah. for your work. Thanks. Thanks.